Hey, it's your pal Mike Squires, and this is the Couch Riffs Podcast, episode number 216. That's so stupid. For people listening, I was trying to hold up my fingers appropriately, and I don't only have five fingers on one hand, so it doesn't really work out. This is terrible fucking TV. Um, my guest is the incredible Lisa Kakala. She is the singer of the Bell Rays. If you do not know the Bell Rays music, just stop right now and go go listen to the Bell Rays. Then come back, watch and listen. Trust me. Do yourself this favor, and you're welcome. Uh, I've been a fan for since I don't think they came on my radar till maybe 2003 about then. Uh, and it is just, it is exciting music to me. I love it. And she's got the most excellent voice. She sang on a couch video for, I need to know the Tom Petty song. Also, Bob has been in a video. Bob, um, is Lisa's husband and bandmate in, uh, the bell race. He was on Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. And they're fucking, I just think they're the best. So I hope that you go check out the band. Go check them out live. They'll be touring later this year. Check their website for tour dates. And, you know, I got to fucking weasel my way. They're all, they always have a rotating cast in this band. I got to weasel my way into this band. Um, I hope that you enjoy this conversation. I really, really, really loved having uh, some time with Lisa. She is as cool uh, as she is talented. So I hope that you enjoy. If you're enjoying the Couchers podcast, please support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Couchers. That's the only place where you can download the audio for all of the cover songs. So if you want to have the MP3 of Lisa singing, uh, I need to know. That's the only place you can get it. And you get, you know, advance previews of the videos at different levels there's different things go check it out please i'm not gonna i I hate trying to sell myself on this thing just know that to do all of this and make the videos it costs a significant amount of money and i couldn't do it without patreon so i really appreciate your support thank you uh, also, I would like to thank a couple people who do support a couple of organizations that support Couchress. First of all, I'd like to thank River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington. River City Guitars is a small by appointment guitar shop, vintage, used in boutique uh, instruments exclusively. If you are on tour traveling through Spokane, you should definitely hit them up. Go look at their reverb also. They're back on reverb, and they are slowly putting the inventory up, but it is moving as fast as they can post it. So uh, make sure to follow them so that you see whenever they post new things there. Also, catch them on social at River City Guitars. And if you've got a vintage piece or a collection that you would like to move, reach out to themsales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. Tell them I sent you. They're like family. I love those guys. Thank you, River City Guitars. Also, thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Variety Coffee has a number of cafes throughout Brooklyn and Manhattan. I drink their coffee every single morning at home. Okay. I don't know what a, I can't give a better endorsement than that. So, Check out their subscription service. You uh, you want to never run out of coffee at home? Subscribe to Variety Coffee. Go to their website, varietycoffeeroasters.com. Click a couple buttons, and it'll show up every week, every two weeks, or every month. Bing, bang, boom. You're never running out of coffee, and you're stoked, just like me. Thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters. Follow them on socials at Variety Coffee Roasters. That's it. We're going to jump into the episode. Thank you so much for watching, listening, subscribing, liking, all the shit, all the stuff, you know, you know the deal. I really appreciate it. Um, Don't forget the golden rule, you guys. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's not that fucking hard. Um, Who does, who counts from six, right? (laughs) The jazz guys. I guess so, huh? I guess so. <laughs> Jazz guys and Dave Matthews. And Dave. 
<laughs> Sorry, Dave. Come on the on the podcast. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> how's your How's your weekend going? It's uh pretty good. It's it's the weather here is is sunny, but not cooking you to death like it can do um, out here in Riverside, which is where I'm calling you from. Uh, so it's it's nice. And it will do again. Oh yeah, it can do and will <laughs> oh, yes, do. Yes, it will. Are are you first from... day of spring, right? <laughs> what? It's is the it? first day of spring, isn't it, or something? I think so, or some. Or Today is in that realm. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe no. I'm. Can it be? People were talking about it being spring. I I was listening to a, a meditation thing today, and they said that that it's the start of spring. And then I got something from a yoga studio that said they were doing like these these things that they normally do with the change of the seasons and it was today. So I figured, Oh, well it must be like the first day of spring, but it seems we, right. The 21st, pulled, isn't it usually like one of those days? To our front and uh, the tulip bulbs that my wife planted before the winter are starting to come up. Like you see the little mm-hmm. green little leaves. That would be very appropriate. We didn't notice mm-hmm. it yesterday, but it's like, you know, it's like fool's spring here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Spring is always kind of like that, though, isn't it? Isn't it always we'll, kind of cajoling you into trying to think it's something else? We'll probably get another snow. I don't even know. It drives me crazy. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Are you from California? I am born in Los Angeles, and we relocated here when I was about eight, which is about 60 miles east of Los Angeles. Is Riverside that far? So it's still Southern California. It is. It, well, 55 miles, if you want to be exact, but um, as the crow flies, it'd be pretty quick to get there. But driving through California traffic, which I'm sure you're aware of, it's a long haul. <laughs> it can be. It can be. Yeah. Where, where before that, before you ate, where were you at? South Central Los Angeles. That's where you're Before you were born, I even you... remember it being called that. Yeah. It was just called Los Angeles. Yeah, the whole thing. All of it was LA. I remember back in a time when um the thing that made Riverside seem weird is that our area code changed when we moved here. Huh. And our area code was shared by not just us, but Orange County. Um, like it was it was like there was the LA area code, which was 213, and then there was 714, which was like everything else that was Southern California up until that time. And I remember that was the kind of the marker of of being somewhere else, of being somewhere a little bit further away. But it was still, if you think about it now, it was still pretty close to everything else. I'm, yeah, when I lived in the East Bay, we had a 415 area code, and then it changed Right, and we were far. I mean, but we were four, we had a Bart line. We yes. were on the Bart line, but we, it we were four one five, and then it changed to like something. I don't know, something crazy. But that was weird. Then you realize, yes, there are so weird. many numbers to go around. We, uh, you were a kid. <laughs> there are only so many numbers. I was a kid when. Yeah, it's confusing <laughs> to a kid. It's confusing to a kid. It's uh, kind of confusing to an adult too. After a while, <laughs> <laughs> well, w- when you're an adult, you know better to even bother trying to understand anything. <laughs> you know, right? So true. Uh, what what got you into singing? Did, were you singing at a very young age? I was. I was singing at a super young age. My mom, um, she's never sang professionally, but she's a twin. And her and her sister used to sing to each other, you know, and with each other and harmonize and do all this stuff growing up to keep, you know, keep themselves busy. So she, it was just something that I picked up from her having, like doing that around the house or just doing it. I have no memory of not singing. I was never like out performing until I think the first thing that I ever performed at where I just said, I'm going to get up here and I'm going to sing. I was at summer camp um, when I was about seven or eight. And 
it was like right before we moved to Riverside, I went to summer camp and was in a talent show and just sang a song that I had memorized, but I was good at memorizing songs and learning how to do that before then. Where does a kid go to summer camp in Los Angeles? <laughs> we went to, and that's so fa- funny that you mentioned that. It was right, I remember it so vividly, and it was the only time I ever went. Um, it was right next to um, Magic Mountain, which is our big Six Flags theme park out here. Yeah. And it was called Stanley Ranch. That's all I remember of it was that name, Stanley Ranch. I'm sure it's probably, I'm sure there were other names attached to it, but that was all I remember as a kid, Stanley Ranch. That's butted up to like the foothills of the grapevine. Is that right? Am I thinking of, am I remembering Yeah, like Simi Valley. I think it's considered Simi Valley-ish, kind of, that whole area over there. What kind of stuff were you guys doing there? Kid (laughs) stuff, kid activities. Uh, Macrame. Yeah, Macrame, making God's eyes, running from snakes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God's eyes for the you know macaroni, everything probably. <laughs> and campfires at night. That was the thing that I loved the most. Was you had this big pit that just seemed enormous as a kid, and you know they had a fire going, and then by the fire you would do. They would have a talent show. And do you, I, do you remember what you sang? Reason, I bet you remember. I had, Oh yeah, I did uh, Oscar Brown Jr. Signify a Monkey. That was the song. I it don't was, know this it was song. Like it's kind of before rap was rap. It was said the Signify a Monkey to the Lion one day. Hey, there's a great big elephant down the way, going round talking. I'm sorry to say about your mama in a scandalous way. That stuff is like burned into my skull, and it's it's a long tune, but it. It's kind of like I just sang it and did the rhythm to it. And I remember people clap, like clapping along with it to keep it going and not asking them to do that. And it was just one of those songs that just kind of had that in it. So I, I figure I, I had the, the golden bit she needed, the ability to keep rhythm and stay in key and not melt <laughs> under pressure. <laughs> did you, as a kid, did you have the forethought? Like, that's kind of like picking a set list, right? Like writing a set list. Did you have the forethought to think this is a crowd pleaser? Or was that just a song that you were into that you loved? I think knew? it was just a song that I, I was that song. And um, that song I remember remembering as a kid, Joe Tex, I gotcha. Um, Natalie Cole, This Will Be an Everlasting Love. I remember that song. I remember the Beatles, Hey Jude. But I never remember. I always thought it was like on television. You know, when you watch, uh, when you would watch somebody perform music on television, it would be one song. You know, oh, everybody just traveled that far just to see somebody play one song. It right. never occurred to me. <laughs> oh, no, this is what they have to do to put the show together. You know, Sonny and Cher can't have them do. The Jacksons can't do an entire, the Jackson 5 can't do an entire set. Because, you know, this is somebody else's show and they have to have other people on there. Right. It, that didn't occur to me. <laughs> well, why would it occur to a kid, right? I know. I know. Even when you watch The Little Rascals and stuff like that, it was always one number. Everybody came on and did one song. So it was this, the variety show was rich in my mental, in my mental mind. When you got it, so it was well received. People were clapping along. People, oh, here comes the dogs. Hey, you guys, get on out of here. Go on. Go on out of here. Go. You too, Mr. Big. Go on out of here. Uh, people. He's people, got a partner in crime. <laughs> that's Ramble and Rose and Mr. Big. They like to kick up some <laughs> dust around here and regulate the neighborhood. There's a lot of squirrels and whatnot. Um, So, yeah, no, they don't like squirrels or cat. They don't like anything, really, if I'm honest. People people (laughs) dug it. People were clapping along. And there were. I mean, granted, the people, like, let's be real honest about who the people were. The people were other people my age. Yeah. So, (laughs) but but it doesn't matter, right? You know, four years above that. No, it doesn't really matter. In fact, it's, 
maybe even a stronger win, you know, because it's you get you got kids behaving and not, you know, not just walking away away from you or, you know, learning to be hecklers. Right. You know, it, which it could it could go that way. And it didn't. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember the feeling when you when you got done? Do you remember how you felt? I remember relief. That was what I felt when I was done, because I remember in the middle of doing it while I was singing, doing the song, I remember thinking, oh, my God, my the back of my leg is shaking like I could feel it kind of jittering back and forth. I remember being aware of that and just thinking. And this is one of my one of the things that I've used ever since. Just get through it and at least you'll be done once you once it's over, it's over kind of thing where I just kind of push propel myself to just keep going and get it done. But I remember that sense of relief once I was once it was over and being shocked when I heard applause. I just remember thinking, okay, I'll, after I'm done with this, I'll just go and sit down. Because I remember other acts were there. You know, other people had done other things. I don't remember what those things were, but I don't remember a round of applause. And I remember getting a round of applause. What a good feeling! So you you were you weren't necessarily. <laughs> An, like a natural performer. You didn't go up there with 110% no. confidence. You were nervous early. No, no, I was not in a choir. My mom did not attend a church. Like I was raised Catholic and we didn't go to like some gospel church where, you know, they have kids singing in choirs and doing all that stuff all the time. I went to the scary I remember church. The, the, <laughs> I went to the scary church that had the weird shit, you know, like a guitar what was it? Uh, the the guitar guy that would there'd be a uh, I forget what they call it. It was it was something like a gu a guitar choir or something where you had a couple people playing guitar and then other people singing kind of folky versions right. of Hallelujah and that kind of stuff. Right. And so how how did your how did your sort of exploration of using your voice evolved from that that moment from that that day <laughs> that's interesting uh i like to think of it as like my lesson were the all the the records that we had at the house and a pair of headphones and i mean literally after school every day i remember coming home and just putting on records like songs in the key of life by stevie wonder and every other record that he had done before that you know, just putting it on the turntable, putting the headphones on and literally laying, laying on the floor, listening to that stuff from cover to cover. And I remember a bunch of them had the lyrics in there. So I would read the words to those songs. And for a while I could sing any of those songs, man, just off the top of my head. Cause I had sung them so much though. My, uh, my, uh, 10,000 hours of, you know, when you put your 10,000 hours in to become a professional at something, I think most of it was listening to records with headphones on and you learning 10, how to sing hours and just singing by the to fifth them. grade. 10,000, <laughs> probably. <laughs> That's a, a magical record. That, uh, what it holds up like it, it is absolutely timeless. Oh, yeah. I think it changed the record industry. I think records like that made people think, uh, I'm not that he was the only one that was exploring in that way. You know, there's so many albums that are like, not like songs in the key of life, but that leave a mark in a way that make people just kind of say, no, this, you can be making great records all, all around your career, but then there's the one, then there's the one that you make that's just the cherry on top of like records. And I remember the reason I always remember thinking about how great that record was is I remember the year before that record came out, Paul Simon winning the Grammys and thanking Stevie Wonder for not putting a record out. And I remember uh, uh, thinking uh. about that when I heard that the songs in the key of life come out and like, Oh, that's why he was thanking him. Cause he just knew this thing was just going to be insane. Like he knew it was going to just blow it out of the water. Everything that's, out that's of the water. That's hilarious. Right. 
When was the next time that you sang in front of other people or, or with other people? Um, after that, I decided to start like, it was this thing where, you know, you, you'd go to family functions. And since we had moved to Riverside, we weren't around our family as frequently as we would have been before, because when we moved out here, no one else lived out here, but us and like holidays, you get together and we just kind of have these performances or people would just stand up and sit around and sing in front of people. I remember doing that in front of my family for the first time after, after the thing with the talent show and just kind of thinking, Oh, this is, I have an urge to not even really an urge to do it. I was so scared and shy to do that kind of thing. And it seemed even scarier with people you knew because it was easier to just kind of say, oh, I don't even really know those people that were at camp. So it doesn't matter whether they like it or not. I can just get up here and do it. But to start thinking about family, it was scary. I still feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I would rather perform in front of a room full of strangers than a room full of friendlies any day. Yep. It's always nerve wracking when you know somebody that you actually know is out there watching you, listening to you. Right. Especially if it's someone that you, you respect or like, you know, a musical peer oh, yeah. or something. I really want you to love it. That's what you're thinking in your mind. I really want, but really you just rather they not talk about it at all. That's you the wish worst that part they of didn't festivals. Any... <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> the worst part of festivals is like someone over on the side of stage and you're just like, oh man, Ugh, just get out of I here. Know, I know. Get out of here. You're making me nervous in front of these thousands of people. Uh, did you eventually get into choir at school or chorus or any, anything like that? I had a really weird, uh, it's so strange that my musical career is in like at school and that kind of thing. It just never took off. Every time that I would go and try to audition for a, a part in a musical or try to do choir and that kind of thing, I was constantly being made to feel like, Oh, your, your voice is really low. I don't, you can't do this one part. So it's kind of like, you're not useful, that kind of thing. So I just remember, I remember thinking as a kid, now this is just, this is who I, the core of my being is. So it's been a lifesaver for me. I just remember thinking, well, whatever's going on here, it's not right. Like, it's not something, it's not me, it's them. That's what I was, I remember thinking that. Cause I remember, I remember just kind of having a lot of faith in what I sounded like to be like, well, there's just somebody else out there that's going to recognize that, that this is something good. But um, I just remember it being not being able to get into choir, not, not really feeling comfortable going into choir or theater or anything like that, because I just kind of felt like I'd be stuck behind the scenes. Right. Um, and, you know, I just, I didn't realize too, that that's still a good thing to be in those organizations doing that. But there was also this fear of, am I being put there because I'm not talented or am I being put there because I'm a woman or am I getting put there because I'm black or like, there were a lot of these kind of feelings that start to go on in my own inner dialogue when that was going on, that kind of kept me from branching out. I mean, that's when you think about families like where Whitney Houston came from and those kind of places where that's really helpful because you get a school, you get a bunch of people that are there telling you, no, this is how this works. This is the way all of this stuff happens, you know, and, and you have this core of people that are just kind of telling you, yeah, you're going to be in the background for a while. And then eventually somebody's going to see you or, yeah, your voice is this, but you're just going to work it until you get to this other point. I didn't really have that. I didn't really have that kind of a dialogue. I wasn't around people that really understood that. Um, for me. So, you know, you just do what you do. <laughs> Make it work. Right. So 
was there ever was there ever any encouraging thing that did happen during school because at this point you're talking about high school yeah um yeah that's high junior high and high school it was kind of like that my sixth grade year um i was fortunate enough to get a teacher that was absolutely amazing his name was mr terry and he played piano and he was in a band and he did all that stuff and he actually encouraged anybody who was musical to be in the talent show. I remember actually trying not to do it and he knew that I could sing and he, he almost, you know, he just said that, that can't happen. You can't not perform in this thing. Right. And I remember singing, he, and he learned whatever it was that we wanted to play. I remember one, one girl played a boss, sang a boss skag song and he learned the piano to play Which behind one? her tomorrow never came. So it was off of one of those weird little records. And I did uh, Pastime Paradise by Stevie Wonder. And he learned the, I mean, this guy was amazing. He was just an amazing teacher and really, really understood how to connect with kids. And I think that little bit helped me just kind of say when those other things came up, you know what? <laughs> I know I got something good here. I know it's worth something. So whatever everybody else is saying, it doesn't really matter to me. That's a that's an important set of tools to have as a young person. I mean, <laughs> we have to use that all like today. Yes. You know? Especially I mean edit and out the noise. Especially in music. <laughs> yes, absolutely in music. Absolutely. And like, especially nowadays in music, like before it seemed like you had to really, if you were trying to make it, there was only one way, one path that you could make it. But once people started being able to just kind of say, no, you can be indie, you know, and that even started with people like Annie DeFranco and doing those kind of, that kind of promotion where you just figure out how to do it yourself and just do it that way. And then it got even easier as you get into YouTube and just kind of really being able to find your people and have people find you if that's how you want to do it. You didn't, or, or the whole idea of people having to tour and all of that, it really started to narrow everything down to, oh, well, only a very certain few are just going to make it when you had to, those parameters and those kind of gatekeepers. And then once you lose that, there's... There's room for not just different ways to do it, but different things to hear, you know, different things to listen to. You just, there's, there's no knowing, there's no way to really know how, what it is that someone will like. Right. There's an audience for everything. <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> for better or worse. For yeah. better or worse. So what what was the what was the first opportunity you had to be a part of something that felt like you were doing it? This is weird too, but um the first group that I was ever really a part of was also with my husband Bob, so it's really been this thing that we've been doing. It was just called the Rose Thorns at the time and I've been basically in two bands my whole life with the same person. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's incredible. It is. Or very narrow. Like, <laughs> I'm like I mean if like it's just gotta it... be exactly the way I want it. <laughs> if it works, it works. If it works, it works. So how did we you just guys kind of meet? have been on this path together? Um, we were both cooks at this place called the Bull and Mouth. It was a college campus burger joint for uh -huh. the University of California, Riverside. And we were scheduled to work together um, regularly because we were both students. He was a student at one college uh, and I was a student at the university. And so our schedules just kind of worked around that. So that was how we met. We were scheduled to work together and then eventually became friends and then eventually more than that. Right. 
And were you guys married early on? We were. I was 20 when I got married. Um, so we just, in fact, we just celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary. That's incredible. I know. I know. It's insane when you think about like marriage is probably the most, the, the relationship that you have to work the hardest at, you know, it's not a, it's not a, you know, bad thing because it's that way. It's just every relationship you have to work at it. You just never really think about it until it's somebody that you, you bring in to create a new family with. (laughs) Right. But you have to work at a relationship with your sister. You have to work at a relationship with your mom, dad, whoever. It just never feels like it's work. But that, that marriage is what you just really have to, you got to roll up your sleeves and be ready to do it. Let me ask you this. Do you remember how the music conversation came up with Bob? We were on shift. And one of the things that happened uh, at this place that we worked at, you had to, they had reel to reel music that you had to put on the reel. And it was a <laughs> like a compilation record that they had that were for for specifically for that place. It was great. It was a great music, uh, great music to listen to. And there were certain ones that you could play in the, in the daytime and other ones that you had to play at night when it changed, when it really shifted into a bar full, full gear. And that music started a conversation one night when we were working. And then I remember the next day we were opening and that day that we were opening Bob brought a mixtape an XTC mixtape it had like all it had like five senses working overtime and all of that stuff on it and he brought that into play and I just remember thinking like this is stuff I haven't heard before this is really cool and then we started talking about the fact that he played guitar and I sang and that I was I just started playing in the in the jazz band at school at the university I thought I was going to give that a try and you know if he wanted to come to the performance that I was going to be doing and that right there that just kind of set us up that's when he said oh she can sing oh maybe she'll sing in my band oh you know it just kind of got the conversation going what were you listening to at that time you said you hadn't hadn't heard XTC I was big into Prince, big into what was, you know, like what was on the radio. And it was a great time for the radio, I think. You know, there was so much Prince, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, when he was just hitting it, you know, with, with, uh, I mean, actually all the way through junior high and up through there, the off the wall, um, the thriller that came after that. I mean, it was just... It just, that was the music that just kind of, you heard all the time and MTV was hitting. So the stuff that I was exposed to that was on, uh, that would show up on videos on MTV, some, a lot of that was really new, but we were also, I could also, I was also hearing stuff like Devo, but I wasn't buying those records. It was just stuff that I was hearing, you know, it wasn't something that had, where I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to spend, you know my $5 that I have to last a month (laughs) on this record (laughs) when, you know, when I could find this, when I found stuff that I was into, you know, right there on TV. Do you think that Michael Jackson would have been as big as he was if MTV hadn't embraced him? I mean, Hmm. I I believe he deserved every ounce of, um, of popularity that he received. I mean, we're in, we're talking about his music and that's, that's all we're talking about. Um, oh yeah. You know. That's yeah. As far as I'm, as far as I see it, if everyone else hadn't been complaining about how MTV wasn't showing black artists, Michael Jackson probably wouldn't have been played as much and 
I still think he would have. I, th- I think he would have got there. There were just yeah. too many people that that had heard that record before. That off the wall record was so oh, amazing. Like I've vi- I've revisited that record um, a couple times already um, in the past few years, and there are just so many elements of whatever he was working on with Quincy Jones and the people that they were getting together to, to come up with these records. It was just a level of quality in songwriting and execution that it's just not, it, there's just not that many people out there that had anything close. Like Prince is doing his own thing during the same time on another level, but it sounds very different. It's like oh, yeah. those, those, those Michael Jackson records still stand up now. Like you, you listen to one of those songs, every element of it is just perfection. The incredible thing, the thing that kind of crushed my head when I listened to the, del- like the deluxe, uh, you know, version of Thriller is you get to the demo recordings yes. that were done in yeah. Michael Jackson's like home studio. Yes, and they him are, and Janet. <laughs> they are fully formed and yes. they are incredible before Quincy gets his hands on them. Yes. They yes. are filthy. And they are. that the hair on my arm just stood up. That changed, yep. you know, Pip repivoted the way that I perceived him as a musician. Oh yeah. Um, I oh, was yeah. just like <laughs> He was fully devoted to his instrument and his craft. You know, I I I I've never been at that level <laughs> of what I what I hear coming from what he's doing. Who has? Prince? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. A couple people. That's it. I I agree. I I totally and thoroughly agree with that. There's a there's a he was in a very unique position at a very young age with a a super unique talent and he just leaned into it and just to me magnified it out there. He set the bar so high that it I kind of broke the record industry as far as I'm concerned. It kind of made everybody think, oh, this is what everybody's supposed to do. No, everybody's <laughs> not supposed <laughs> to do that. No, everybody's not supposed to sell records on that level. No, it's not, you well, know, also if, it if, just doesn't work yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, you can't put anyone's voice on those songs also. No, no. Can you imagine uh, the Men at Work guys singing over those songs? Doesn't work. <laughs> Doesn't work. No, and so much of it isn't singing. So much of it is just percussive, like just uggs and thugs and knowing what kind of sound to just make to like being being so completely ready to do something silly. And then on top of it, being able to dance to it. Like it's so hard for me as a singer that really wants to sing well to just do it. I, the idea of having to dance around that, figure out how to do a break, have something that works in between there. That's mind boggling. Yeah. There were no, and, there was no tape rolling back then. There was no, you know, did like whatever. I don't know. I'm sure that it before Millie Vanilli, before that thing happened, I'm sure that there were artists that were, you know, performing to some whatever, not real. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Real performances, I mean, that was, but that wasn't his thing. He was no, moving that wasn't and his keeping thing. his breath and just all of it. Yep. The, so he wasn't being played on MTV early on though. And a number of high profile artists talked about it. David Bowie famously talked about it. People like, Yep. I think MTV only gave in under pressure, right? They did. I remember when they started playing his songs. I remember we all we knew the record was already out, but I remember it was a a big lag from the two years prior when they weren't really playing those songs. And specifically that one right before they picked up right. Thriller. Right before Billie Jean, Billie Jean 
kind of came on, but it wasn't even the the video that they were starting to promote at the time that they really started playing them. They had already said, okay, now we're going to promote Beat It. And it was during that time that they started promoting Beat It that I remember, oh, now this is, now we see them all the time. Right. That's Do you remember, remember the excitement but around? But had already been out. I remember when they the day that they premiered Thriller and I was glued to the Oh, television. I do too. It, it was a big deal. They advertised it for like it felt like they advertised it forever that it was Ever. coming. And it was like <laughs> this li- it was this long production and it was I remember watching the how it was made afterwards. Yep. It was really really exciting. Now people can make videos on their iPhones and stuff. But back then it was absolute, absolute elevated, just next level magic. Yep. It absolutely was. It was amazing. It was, um, it was an amazing feeling. I've you just bringing that up. It just reminded me of exactly where I was when that (laughs) it's frozen in your mind. Like that's, that's, I guess for, for today's, you know, to make it relevant to today, like, I don't even really know if there's one thing that people just get completely excited about. Like, it seemed like the whole entire world that was interested in music was excited about that happening. It seemed, it appeared to me. Yeah, no, me too. It seemed like there wasn't a person on earth that wasn't interested Yep. It was as it was like as it was bigger than the Super Bowl. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. You know what I mean? It was. Uh, yes. It was the thing. It was like a Star Wars movie coming out. Yes. Yes. It was. It was like that. Okay, so you said that you were singing in in college. You were in the jazz band in college. I was. So by the time you got to college, you were still like, I've got a, I've got a thing. I'm going to use it. And how did it go auditioning for the college band? And did you find like a more welcoming environment at that point? Where, did you have more I did. sort of? I was trying what I did. This was I was actually trying to quit school. When I ended up in the jazz band, I was trying to figure out a way to not continue on in the university because to me, it was just like, this is not what I wanted. This is, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. You know, you just start doing the things when shit is hard. (laughs) It's just hard. And you just start doing things that just feel, feel so difficult. And, um, you just start figuring out how other ways that you can do something else. So I remember talking to my dad about it and just being like, well, you know, I think I'm going to just go to a community college because I just don't feel like this is really something I want to do. And my dad was adamant about, no, you need to stay there. You just need to find things that matter to you. You know, quit worrying about doing classes that they say you're supposed to take and do something that actually feels like it's something you want to do. Um, Because at that time I was just taking the, you know, the basic, requirement classes, the, the general education courses. That's the worst. And yeah, it is the worst. It is the worst. And I was just, and I wasn't doing well. I wasn't concentrating on it. Um, it was just not, I was not connecting with it at all. Um, and I just remember saying, okay, well, I'm going to take a, a class on jazz. And so I took a class that kind of went into, it was, I think, no, that that was a, it was a guitar class. I took a guitar class at the city college and then found out that the guy that was teaching the guitar class at the city college also taught at UCR. And, and then from there taking, I took a vocal class and found out that those people were still connected to the university that I was at. So it was just kind of this weird anchor that I threw in and, and through them is when I found out, Oh, you should, you should uh, go try out for the jazz band and trying out for the jazz band. I, I was really fortunate to just kind of find a group of people that, that 
I could play with on the college level. And then the, the, the guy who was directing the jazz band knew some people that wrote charts. So then they wanted to get me to sing on some, to try out these charts that they were working. So it was really, it really helped me thoroughly realize that, no, you know how to sing, you know what you're doing and what you do has value. You know, you can, you can do this however you want to do it. But I hadn't, I had no real clear idea of what it was I wanted to perform. I thought I wanted to just sing jazz, but I hadn't really, this is right before I met Bob and the whole idea of an original band just had never really come to me as something right. that I, I'd just be a part of. Did you enjoy singing jazz? I did. I did yeah. like it. I liked it a lot. Um, and I really liked it when we did, when I was able to work on the charts and deal with a big band where you see these guys that just come out, read this chart and just play like amazing arrangements. And you can hear the difference between the pros that used to be able to come out to Riverside. Like these are guys that, you know, played in LA. There, there were a lot of Sinatra's band used to live out in Palm Springs during that time. Right. So there were killer players that were, that lived out in this area. And I was really lucky that I was able to um, understand the difference between like, no, th this is a college band and this is a band. <laughs> like, like this is right. what, this is what it sounds like. This is what it happened. This is what it's like when pros are doing it. Tell me about the first time you got together and played music with Bob and how, <laughs> how different that must have been. It was a shock to the system, to say the least. <laughs> it's one of those stories that Bob, Bob always talks about it too, because I remember we had, we had literally only been working together maybe a month by then, if that. And he said, uh, hey, you know, would you want to come down and try out for my... My band, he had already come to see me perform at, at with the jazz band. And so I felt like, yeah, I can do that. You know, you came out to see me. I can go and at least try out for your band. And I went with him. We drove to the bass player's house, who was where it was just where they practiced. And he was sick at the time. But he said, yeah, we can practice. The drummer showed up, who was a an absolute dick. I don't even remember his name, but he just wasn't a very nice guy. Yeah. Robert. Bob said his name was Robert. And um, he showed up and and just wasn't very cool. Um, Bob was there. Bob was great. And we just kind of sang. He asked me what uh, songs I wanted to play. Like, I, I think I I named some, some old Motown tunes. And... I remember being really impressed because whatever it was I called out, Bob was like, oh yeah, I can play that. Like he would just play it on guitar. He would just pick it out and play it. And I'd start singing to it, but it was the first time I had ever done that. So it's for, for someone that's never been through that, the electric, the electric thing and a live drum kit in a garage and a PA system that's kind of kicking back at you. It's not like you're on a stage. It's nothing like that. It, it was a real shock to the system. And I remember after I sang the first song, Bob said, what do you want to do next? <laughs> and I said, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you sang another song. I think I sang another song, but after that, we just kind of didn't, we didn't go down that road. We just didn't go down that road for a while. Our our how we became a band had more to do with us being married and having a child and me not wanting Bob to just go off and be in a band and spend more time away from <laughs> from me <laughs> while I'm doing my music, like us going in separate directions. It had more to do with me just saying, you know, well, I'll just do this so I can be in your band and we can figure it out. You know, we'll make this thing work. So it did not go well. No, but it wasn't for any, it wasn't any fault of his and it wasn't any fault of what being in a band was. It was just the shock of like, 
I just didn't know what to expect. Well, I just didn't know that it was going to be something like that. And I wasn't playing a guitar. I wasn't playing anything with electricity or, you know, that felt like it was going to be something like that. And, and I, and the other thing that it does that it did for me is it brought up this hyper criticism of what I was hearing from myself, like what I, the way that I heard my voice, because right. When you go from singing, at least for me, when I went from singing jazz to singing that, and you compare, you your mind starts to compare, oh, this is what, it, you know, this is the way that this Martha and the Vandella song goes, and you're not Martha and the Van, and there are no Vandellas <laughs> going with you while you're playing right. this, so it doesn't sound anything like it. It was really hard to appreciate what it could turn into, to see that it was supposed to be something different to see that it wasn't supposed to be this perfect interpretation of what was happening. And at the same time, you got to learn how to sing to that. I had to find my voice, you know, when I was and finding my voice doesn't mean learning how to sing. It's learning how to find that best singing inside, find the thing that is going to make me feel like, Oh, that's you singing. That is what you sound like. It takes it takes a while to find that place as a musician. So the experience, though, did not deter your guys's romance. No, we were still we still got scheduled to work together. We still did all this stuff at the time that was uh, fun and easy to work around. But Bob's just not one of those. He's not an egomaniac. So something like that would never make him that kind of guy. Um, and he just kind of said, Oh, I guess it's just not, it's just not something you're into doing. But then, cause I was trying out for his band without ever having seen his band. Then I remember being able to see his band and that's when I fell in love with him is when I saw him playing in his band. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. I love that. And so... When did you, and what was the, the moment when you guys were like, all right, let's, let's do this. You said you guys had a kid. Yeah. We'd already gotten married. We'd already been married for a year. Well, no, going on a year by then. No, it hadn't been a year. It was within the first year of being married that we kind of, I remember Bob was going to reform. He had just broken up one band or one version of a band, got rid of the drummer and was looking to do something else. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then just decided, no, we should do this. We should just try to do this together. I want to say it was like six months in that um, we just said, okay, well, let's give this a try. And it was then that we started, um, that I started singing it in the Rose Thorns. And what's the difference between the Rose Thorns musically and and the Bell Rays? It was just more straight hard rock at the time. It was just, you know... uh, Cause so much of what we sound like now, I feel like we've come almost full circle. We went, you know, when we did the bell rays, we were shooting for a more, a jazzier element, something that just kind of was a little outside of the norm. And I think the, the rose thorns was just more straight rock and roll. Got it. Did you guys, uh, I should know this. Did you guys make recordings as rose thorns? We made one record. We made one record and it was uh, independently put out and literally, I think right after it was put out, the band broke up and we started the Bell Rays. I know that feeling. It's a stinker. Uh, (laughs) And (laughs) it is a stinker. You guys clearly still had a lot of energy and were like, no, we, what, what were you carrying forward from the Rose Thorns into the Bell Rays where you're like, how did you, how did you move forward 
with enthusiasm and how did you guys choose the change of sort of path to have more of a garage R&B thing happening early on? Well, see, that's the other thing is that it didn't really reflect this whole garage R&B thing that I guess was brewing. We didn't realize that's what it was. We were stumbling around and there was just this feeling of when you just don't know, you know what you're doing is not where it's supposed to land, but you're just trying to find that place. That was kind of where we were for three or four years with the bell rays, just trying to figure out how we're going to get to where we're getting. Cause there's so much convincing that had to be done during that time, like convincing people to be in the band because we're in Riverside. We're not in LA. We're not, we're not holding auditions for a lot of people that really know what it is that they need to do. And we don't even really know what it is we're asking them to do yet. We're super green as far as knowing how to run a band, how to do what's going on during that time. You know, it was hair bands that the record labels wanted. Bobby used to send out, uh, letters asking for, you know, wanted to, you know, trying to get the band heard. And it was easy for people to just kind of reject us on a photo. Right. Or say, because they saw a black girl on the cover, oh, it must sound like Tracy Chapman. You know, we've had so many things (laughs) where people, where you just knew you weren't being heard, you weren't being listened to. And we internalized a lot of that. We just kind of figured so much of it had to do with what we were doing, that what we were doing just wasn't good enough. And there's some of that, but there's also some of it where just people are just waiting for something to be the next thing. And then once it's the next thing, they only want that thing over and over again. It is... So much That's, rage and frustration colors my whole, when I think about that time, when you talk about us having energy to go forward and do all these other things, most of it just came from like, what do we have to do? <laughs> what do we have to do to get the people that we need to play what we want them to play? And then to get the other people that want to hear this to actually listen to it. You know, it was, it was a very, I remember it just being, you know, angst ridden (laughs) so much stuff trying to get it done and raising a child right during all that so just the frustration of of everything was motivating you yes i do not recommend it (laughs) (laughs) to anybody out there (laughs) it is a it's a that's a tough fire to burn yeah it doesn't burn clean it is, no, it doesn't. It doesn't burn clean. And I mean, it's the truth. It's what we were going through. It is how our experience, it is what led us to be what we are. It is the way that I found my voice is learning how to sing behind that and just kind of push that through. Um, so if that's the journey we had to take to find to find our treasure, which is, you know, just knowing how to maneuver and operate in our own world as our best musical selves, you know, I think it's worth it for that. But everybody's journey is not the same. It just doesn't work that way for, you know, for everyone out there. How long did it take for you guys to get a a consistent, steady lineup and record a record and where did you find a home we had well we never found a home just to be very clear about that we've never had a label that has been like oh we did our last label we did our last record there and we're going to do another le- record there so we've always we to this day we're still looking for that and i'm not even sure that we're looking for it it's just we've never really had that on our in front of us as something to actually choose the band thing. The first record that we did, um, that, that lineup was together for about a year. And that's up until about 95. 
we were just in and out of people. And from like 95 to 99 was when we had a lineup that, that really was a consistent lineup. And that's when we started getting some notice because we were actually able to just play right. uninhibited, you know, and able to kind of express that or, or at least experiment with that, that danger. We were trying to get that jazz rock punk thing that we were just trying to do because it felt right for the kinds of songs we were playing. I'm not imagining this, right? Bob has played guitar and bass in the band. He has. He yeah. has. He started off as the bass player. And then when we decided uh, with our friend Tony at the time that instead of him trying to just keep his band together and us trying to keep our band together, it would be great if he came and played. Because he would always sit in and play bass for us. And then when we needed a bass player and Bob would do the same for him, but then we just said, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just do this and Bob will play bass behind you because he knows what it takes to play bass behind the stuff. And getting Bob on the bass to do that completely changed like how the drive of the band, the focus, and just it was it just became laser. <laughs> we just were able to really hone in on a sound that really worked for us. Is that because the two of you had such a unified vision of what it was and Bob was now in the rhythm section and he could sort of connect with the drummer and sort of like make that happen more? It had everything to do with Bob to me. It had everything to do with him deciding to do, to go to the bass and understanding what, the songs that he had written and had been playing on guitar needed behind them. Him doing that made it much easier for me to find where it was that I needed to sing it. To say that it was a concerted effort that we had in advance or we masterminded, I wow. didn't have that. Yeah. I didn't have that in me. I didn't have anything, you know, it wasn't like I was, you know, this is my master plan and this is <laughs> what I've been waiting for. No, I, I wish, I wish I had that. But I didn't. You guys have been over to Europe uh, a bit. Yes, we have. Let's talk about the opportunities for for musicians to perform in Europe that exist uh, there uh, that do not exist here in America. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the interworkings of them, those those actual opportunities. I just know that for us, it seemed that there were people much more ready to experience what it was we were doing in places like France, for example, because that was the first invitation we ever got was to go to the Trans Musicals Festival in 1999. Um and the whole thing about that festival is you get asked to do it once in your career. And we were lucky enough to be one of those groups that they asked to do that. It's like a music exposure thing that they do in, uh, I can't remember what part of France, but it's Brittany. Somewhere around that area is where that, that, that happens. And because of that, like because they were willing to take that chance, we were asked to go over there and we also got a TV show to do that. This is without having anything released in Europe at all. Somebody heard about us, talked to Wayne Kramer while he was over there doing something and they knew that we had played a show with them. He, you know, asked, could it, it would it be possible to get the bell rays over? He talked to some people and we got an email a little while later saying that we were invited to do that. TV show and Trans Musicals Festival. And having those two things when we first locked in with no record, no, and nobody really coming to offer a contract at the same time. It was just, it was just one of the weirdest things that was going on for us at the time. So, but I, that wouldn't have happened in the States. I don't right. know how you'd even get on anything with national TV or, 
or even a festival like that, um, just across the water, somebody looking for us. Like I, I, we're so fortunate, you know, maybe things like that do exist, but I don't know about them here in the U S how did that go? Amazing. Amazing. Like on every level we played, this is the kind of festival that the festival was. We played at like three o'clock in the morning after public enemy. So public enemy was on the bill and the thing went 24 hours. This festival went like just around the clock. That's we nuts. Three it is nuts. It's absolutely nuts. And there was one stage to my knowledge that you played on. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Did you talk to those guys? They wouldn't talk to us. <laughs> really? Not. We tried. We tried. I remember Bob, like us even trying to go to our dressing room, we got like hassled trying to get to our dressing room right. that we what were at. What are you at. guys doing? Yeah. Going to our dressing room. And then Bob said, oh, there's Flavor Flavor. And the guy's like, mm, he's not into that. <laughs> 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 I'd be much, much more interested in talking with Chuck anyway. It but they were like... not available. I mean, this is during the time we've done shows. We've done shows with people. We did a show with NERD like back in 2008 or something like that, where you're on the same show in countries like this was the Exit Festival. And you can't like, they are so insulated. Yeah. Like people backstage can't even like say hello or yeah. wave to somebody like it's crazy it's it's absolutely just nuts the level of the levels of stardom i should say yeah there's there are always <laughs> those bands it's always interesting at festivals for me to observe what bands will not allow other people on the side of the stage, which yeah. is funny. Cause we, that's how we kind of, that was the first thing we were talking about. Exactly. Like exactly. It, it makes me uncomfortable, but no band I've ever been in has been prima Donna enough to say, no, nobody on me the neither. Side of stage. Me but neither. Never. Like nine inch nails. They're like, sure. Come on up. But there are other bands that are like, get out of here with that shit fanboy. <laughs> I know. I know and I'm just thinking you know what's the super strength to show like to have people there and be scared that they're there but just be like you know that's just not that's just nature or to be so I've got to be in control that I've got to make sure that no one is there. And that right. means if someone is there I'll be completely freaked out and just go crazy. You know, I don't know if that's what that it all happens like, but still it's just rock and roll is supposed to be rock and roll at some level. Yeah. How dangerous <laughs> More than is anything it to else. have a completely <laughs> controlled environment? Yes. 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 Do you have a favorite size venue? Do you have a favorite venue? I do, but I don't think it exists anymore. We used to play at this place called Al's Bar down in Los Angeles that was amazing. And it was just a, it was a small, like maybe 200 cap. That's about, that's my, fa that's my sweet spot. I love 200 cap because that means everybody standing can see, usually they can see everything. And if it's a tried and true venue for 200 cap, that means that they're, you know, nobody's going to die. Nobody's gonna die if if everybody doesn't drink 17 beers you know <laughs> it's one of those things where it's just there to be enjoyed and people can just kind of hang out and and have a good time and you can see everyone from stage also and which you can is a... see everyone from stage and you really can't bullshit people with that either you can't there's no room for pyrotechnics there's no room for any big weird show you can't be too big of a star to be there either like you can't be smelling your own farts and play those kind of venues and be like i'm the shit you know right. that kind of thing after the festival because i assume that was probably kind of a that feel like hitting and leveling up 
for the band. You were like, all right, well, here we go. This is another it, another notch. It did. It seemed like that is exactly where we were going. Um, like that was the natural next step. I think if we had a record label that was a real tried and true record label that knew what they were doing. And, but I don't know if you remember that time very well, but during the time that we were like being noticed was the great, <laughs> that was when all the record labels, like at the, in 98 or somewhere around there, they're being were, bought up. We and woke sold. up one morning and they said, all of these guys are gone. All of these labels are gone. They've just kind of, we have a guy that was working with us um, from, uh, what's the one, the Herb Alpert record label, A&M, A&M okay. records that had been, he had been going our shows just like, we knew the, he wanted to sign us and do all this other stuff. And then the neck that <laughs> I want to say like weeks before he was planning on doing it, it was, everything was just gone. It was all gone. So there was really all the pathways that everybody said, you do this and you do this other stuff. And everything's just going to line up the way that it's going to work. And it didn't happen that way. Didn't happen that way for us. So even though we did, we had these really cool things happen for us, there was nothing, no triggers were being pulled anywhere else to kind of make it. And we weren't smart enough to know, Oh, you know what? We should just get a pub. We should just get a publicist and have them do this. Our thinking was we don't have the money to get anything. We just need to get out there and play and show everybody that, you know, we're great at doing this. Right. But you weren't being offered the kind of money to just go out there and, <laughs> and do that. And for four people to be able to afford to uh, do something like that. I mean, even with a record contract, four people probably still couldn't really afford to do it. But you're so crazed with the feeling of everything is changing that it would, you do it anyway. You know, and we were crazed to do it even without having any of that other stuff. <laughs> and all through this time, you guys are raising a child. Yes. Yes, we are. And we so are doing all of that. <laughs> how does that, ba how, like, how does everything balance? So much of it just had to do with us saying, well, you know what? We just got to do it. <laughs> that was how we did everything back then. When I think about like, once we found our sound, it was, that was our whole deal. Bob and I really put our money where our mouth was because we said, look, all the years before when we were trying to find the sound, find the band, we we're like, all we need to do is get this. Once we finally got it, we said, okay, we're ready to tour. We'll do whatever we need to do to tour we started running into trouble with the other people in the band, not really wanting to do those things after saying before that they did. And it's really easy for people to say those things that they want to be on the road. They want to go on the road. They want to do all this stuff when they don't have to do it. Like right. that's there's when I get asked about advice to give younger musicians or people out there, whatever. One of the things I used to always say is don't do it unless you have to do not be in a band, do not play music, do not do any of that stuff unless you absolutely have to do it. Because if you don't really have to do it, you're absolutely in the way of everybody else that is actually doing it for those and reasons. And you'll be miserable. And you'll be miserable, but a bunch of them don't understand that. They think you're trying to take their dreams away. And I'm not trying, I mean, maybe I am trying to take their dreams away because I, I'm not working on dreams. I'm working on goals. Right. I'm actually, you know, I got shit to actually do. And you wanting to lie to yourself and make yourself feel like you can, that you want to do this or that you have what it takes to do this or that you're willing to do this is, you know, it's a real, it's a real tough question. And Bob and I, for being married and having a kid and having the most to lose were the most that were, were, I shouldn't say the most to lose the, the, in the most fragile situation. Um, we were willing to do whatever it took to do that, you know, have people watch our child while we were gone. And right. I mean, luckily by that time she was in junior high school, but you know, it was one of those things where we were, 
we were doing that. We were figuring out ways to make that happen, whether whether we had the players that we had had before or not. And that's when, you know, we really started the musical chairs with the other people in the band. Because it just started moving around so much because we were like, well, now we've got a sound and now we have the audience that wants to hear it. Let's put it out there and let's not miss this opportunity to put it out there. So we did what it took to keep the band out there. There are a lot of really difficult things that can, and like uh, Murphy's Law, they always do, happen on tour. Oh, yeah. Gigs fall through. Promoters don't pay you what you were guaranteed. They don't fulfill contracts. Maybe you've got... Uh, there, there are just a lot of things that can try your patience. Yeah, I know that this is a completely hypothetical situation because all of your touring experience has been with Bob, but that must have been a really, really great for the two of you to go in sort of like as a, there's one, one element, like you have a band, but really the mm-hmm. band is the two of you guys. And then the other two folks, right? We, we've been the consistent members throughout the whole time. Right. The only two. You are, you guys are the band. Yeah. Do you, do you think that you would tolerate, you would have the, uh, the energy to tolerate that kind of the tour BS without that support system of having that relationship? What what a um, an amazing thing! I because the level of stuff that we have put up with, like the van tours and that kind of thing, um, I could do it. I don't know that I would do it, you know, because I because I know now what it all is and what it means and what it looks like. But I have had to go on tour with other groups. I've done stuff with the Basement Jacks and the MC5 where Bob wasn't there with me. And I had to just be on the road with these with these other bands. And those were always way easier than any of the tours <laughs> we had ever had to do on our own. And maybe it's because I have to do so much when I'm on the road for the Bell Rays. I'm, you right. know, I'm on the road... I'm the person that they were dealing with, with the front of house. I'm the person, I'm that person that's doing all of that stuff. So there was really no time to not be completely engaged a hundred percent while those tours are going on. The other ones seemed like a, a vacation almost. I was just like, Oh, I get a check at the end of this after just showing up to do the thing. The one thing that I'm here to do. Awesome. Let me do that. Let me do that thing. That's not what it's that's not what it was like when you're running the band or with me there and running the band. Being a member of someone else's touring band is so much easier than <sighs> it's a dream. <laughs> I, I never want to start a band. <laughs> it's a dream. It's awesome. It's so awesome to just be able to be like uh, sleep in on wow. the bus. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to ask me a question at all about any of this stuff. Are you I ready? just show up when I'm supposed to be at sound check <laughs> and do <Right>. this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what? Who's going to complain about that? <laughs> How, so the first time that an opportunity like that came up for you, how, there's part of that that is very gratifying and there must also be a part of that experience that is frustrating in a way because you see how it can be. Oh yeah. I mean, that's when I, that's when you really have the hard look and you really know the difference between indie and it's not even just a difference between indie and, and signed. It's a, it's a difference between those, bands that have reached that point like you get a hit song you get these other things that just kind of fall into place so that the people come and they buy the records and they do you know all these other elements that just fall into place for some of these other groups that haven't happened for you 
so that, you know, you're still in the van. You're still doing your magnificent musicians, but that has nothing to do with it. How well, how good you are at what you do, how well you play, how great your songs are. If you don't have those other elements kind of lining up, it can affect how much exposure you get, how many other people find out about you. If you if you are so such a unique thing like the Bell Rays are in my mind, who else are they going to compare you to? If they don't have somebody else to compare you to in today's world, they won't book you with somebody else. They won't, you know, it's it's just it's this other element. And Lord knows you better not be a black female doing rock or fronting a band because that's almost as weird as a black guy <laughs> fronting a band or doing right. whatever. It, it's like this, these things that are just out there that make it less, uh, let's just put this in with everything else. It's less like that. It's less, let's see that this is just like these other things. It just happens to be a girl singing in the front of it. It just happens to be a, a black girl singing in the front of it. There's no way to prove a lot of that, but when I look at what we do and how we do what we do and some of the bands that weren't very well known and I don't know, I just get, I, I don't know. I don't know, Mike. I don't know. I've had, <clears throat> I've had two black drummers on the podcast here and both of them have shared with me experiences where they could not get into their own show. And these are guys who are playing Jesus. at a real high level. <sighs> One of them was like, no, man, I'm, I'm the drummer in the band. And they were like, there's no black guy in the band. And yep. there's, there's two black guys in the band. <laughs> One of them is Slash. That's right. People like to ignore that part. Of you know <laughs> anything he's in, they like to ignore that other half. <laughs> the the other guy, um, it was it became such an issue that the band actually made their laminates. They put his face on everyone's laminate. That was the design of the laminate moving forward. Wow, um, wow. So that it just that was just the way they approached it. It was just like, all right, well, here we go. It's re it's a <sighs> yep it's not a um it's it's not exclusive to America, although no, it isn't it isn't um, exclusive to America it's probably a greater issue here um what my big when, thing always is about rock and roll it's like the most famous rock and roll singers are usually white guys that sing like they're black women you know it's right. usually somebody doing something like that so the whole idea of hearing it is obviously something people want to want to are into but the idea of seeing it has become such a foreign thing and i don't know how that happened i don't know where that became the point of like, oh no, this is how, this is where the line is. Cause I know tons of musicians that are all different races that have nothing to do with anything else that play all kinds of music. So it's not like there was a memo that went out that just said, black folks don't do this. <laughs> it's just right. like somebody decided to say, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to make note of it. Anytime somebody says that they do. <laughs> right. What was it like when, when you guys went out on your first van tour? Um, incredibly easy, I think, because we were, we went out on the road. The first tour that we did, real tour, was with Nashville Pussy. Right. And we were just basically right under them. And those kind of clubs and those those kind of audiences, we never had any trouble with anybody just kind of recognizing that this band rocks. We love this. On I I can't even say there was ever a problem 
on stage with any or at the venues or anything like that. I never had any issue at all. I've been in in two touring bands, mul- like multiracial touring bands, and the venues are never the, were never the part where everyone had their guard up because we were definitely eyes open. On the you know, it's like all the where the places that you stop for gasoline in in the middle of where in Idaho, you know. Yes. Missouri or sure. somewhere off the yeah. road where you go to get that fish sandwich that everybody says you got to go get or, right. you know, whatever food place. And then you get into the restaurant and everybody's just gawking at you there together. Were, were there moments where you, where you ever just got up and left or you guys f- forewent in those things because, because of that tension? We've, the only time that we've ever had anything where we had to get up and leave, and I remember this distinctly, because it was right after the Freedom Fries comment, we happened to be in France (laughs) at that time, and we stopped at some little place off the road, and the, I think the owner of the place heard us speaking English, and he, and then our driver, tour manager said, we got to go, and I said, why? The guy said he's not going to serve us. That was the only that was the only thing that happened like that. But I think it was, I think it had more to do with, you know, America than it had to do with (laughs) (laughs) than anything else. But never have I had anything where I had to leave or felt the need to leave um, or feared for my safety because of something like that. Maybe I should have been, but I was just like, I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not I'm not kowtowing to that. Even feelings, because I'm like, I really don't know <laughs> if somebody's doing that or if I'm just interpreting it that way. So let's just push it to with where they gotta say something further if it's if it really is that they don't want me here. They gotta actually tell me they don't want me here. Sure. Yeah, I just I just I don't know, man. I know. <laughs> I know, Mike. I don't know either. It's one of those things I have, we, Bob and I have conversations like this all the time, just about how it's not even how did we get here? It's, it's the basis of, of not just America, it's everywhere that it kind of works like this, where somebody's fighting through some ist, some sexist or racist or whatever the ist is that they're working through. And it's not like it hasn't been that way for forever. It's just now we just seem to have right. them, those conversations a lot more about a bunch of different stuff, a bunch of different types of, of elements that we just didn't have those discussions or not even discussions. We just didn't have people mm-hmm. saying, hey, cut that out. You know, and we finally do have people. Well, we saying, live in hey, the information age now. Yes. So all of this stuff, ping, you know, just echoes amongst us so much faster. It does. And, it really does. And when there's, and we're not waiting action, for laws to really make always... it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really. I don't. I don't put a lot of faith in law. <laughs> no, it's not going to do it. But there's enough people that just start really asking people or saying things like, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for doing that thing that you did or saying that seems to be one of the bigger markers that's made people understand, oh, is that bad form? <laughs> you know? Right. Let's talk about some awesome shit. Yes. Uh this is a funny way to start the awesome shit conversation, but the the last two years, as everyone has sort of, you know, every, things are starting to happen again, which is amazing right. and great. Um, you guys have been doing doing your Instagram live performances, and they're <laughs> they're my favorite. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I love it. Uh, <laughs> 
how, what, how did you guys get, how, I mean, what put you over the edge to, to actually do it? Cause a lot, a lot of folks didn't do anything. I know. I know. I was actually really surprised that so many people didn't, but I was also at the same time that I was surprised about that. I was, I was kind of awed by our decision to do it. Like prior to that point, when, when we were getting ready to go on our Spanish tour that was supposed to happen, I want to say March 13th, we were supposed to get on a plane or somewhere around there, whatever, whatever day it was, we were supposed to get on the plane Two days before that, we were told that was when the president said we couldn't go. Nobody could get on a plane to go anywhere. And we had already figured that this thing was serious. So we were just thinking, oh, okay. But, you know, being a musician, if you're getting on a plane, tickets have been bought. Tickets have right. been like, <laughs> Those tickets are coming due. And I remember trying to get that money back from the airline, and they just did not do anything to try to make that happen. And nobody seemed to be saying anything about them not <laughs> doing anything for this to happen. And so much of touring is about us having to front so much money to go out there and do what it is that we need to do. It's why it's one of the reasons why the entertainment industry suffered so magnificently during that time when there could be no shows or whatever. So ours was, a, you know, it was part of a survival thing. It was like, man, what, what are we going to do? And then at the same time, it was also like, I'm going to go crazy if we just sit here and do nothing. I'm just going to be thinking about how, how bad it is or how there's not enough toilet paper or whatever it is that they're trying <laughs> to tell you to worry about during that time. You're going to be starting to spin on that. And I just also remember thinking, this is a bunch of bullshit that, we are just kind of not, you know, not like, oh, you guys planned this pandemic. It wasn't anything like that, but it was just really, there's not going to be anything that anybody can do for all this time and except watch TV or do whatever. And then it was like, oh my God, there's nothing else for people to do during that time except watch TV. And <laughs> you start thinking about phone. that. And I started catching some of these um, uh, people on uh, a lot of these, uh, what was it? Taylor Swift's manager, ex-manager, Rick Barker. He does a lot of entertainment uh, seminars and that kind of thing about what you, what you should be doing for yourself as a band member. And I remember we were home, one of his things came out and he just happened to say, you know, for those of you that are wondering what to do since there's nothing else, since you can't go on the road, he said, this would be a great time for you to get over that hump and just play music. Just get out there and do it. Just show up. And I remember him saying that and thinking before that, I used to just think about it all the time. How are we going to do this? We need to have a stage. We need to have the lighting. We need to have this so that we can get the whole band there or, or we need to do it so that it's, uh, like uh, there were so many rules that I was putting around us just going and doing this thing to when he said that he said, people need, people just need to have fun while this is going on. And I said, Oh my God, we could totally do that. We can totally just get out there and have fun. That's easy. I don't need to worry about anything. I don't need to rehearse it. I don't need to do any of this other stuff. Bob and I have been doing this for years, just the two of us. So let's just do that. And it's, I'm so glad that we did that. It was it's it was a natural um, mood lifter. It just all of a sudden that whole thing just felt lighter for me just to be able to do it. So it was even more invigorating when you start getting posts from people saying, "Oh my God, you're you're helping me get through this pandemic." You know the the post and what you read from something like that. It was it just felt good to do it, and we just got to that point where we felt like we needed to do, we needed to not just sit at home and wait to see what to do. We could afford to just go out and do it ourselves. We had a place where we could do it. It was just the two of us. We weren't going to be infecting anybody and we would be spreading joy 
across the world. (laughs) (laughs) Did you guys take the opportunity to write new material? During that time, we were actually, we did the absolute reverse. Before that happened, we were working on getting a recording done before we started, before we decided to go live and start playing all the time. And I, I think we just kind of felt like it was either or. It was like we either commit to doing these shows or we work on new material to get right. this record done. And we had already we had already gotten a bunch of the drum tracks kind of demoed and um, working on it, but we did not get anything brand new done during that time. We didn't we didn't we couldn't really lean into it wholeheartedly so we just didn't because we were so busy trying to make sure we learned everything that we needed to learn as things changed with doing these shows online because i don't know you you probably understand it more than maybe a bunch of the people out there watching this stuff but um (laughs) this ain't easy this stuff is not easy to learn how to do like it like you just go and you push play and places like facebook make it easy to do that but easier to do that but I don't know. It's pretty hard. It seems simple. It's pretty from hard a, to learn how to do it from a uh, observer's perspective. You know, they they sure. s- they just see a couple people standing in inside of a camera frame doing the thing, right? But yep, it's kind of like when you pay someone an hourly fee. You're not necessarily paying them for that hour. You're you're paying them for all of the preparation they've done. A their Absolutely. entire life. B, Absolutely. to get there, whatever, you yeah. know, like we're talking about you guys rehearsing and uh, learning a song. Absolutely. The whole thing. That's what you're paying for. Getting that kazoo and part down. Getting that kazoo. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to have Finding the kazoo, the kazoo as the other instrument because yeah. I'm just like, Bob, it's just us. It's literally just a guitar and us. We got to have other things going on. All right. Well, let's do that. <laughs> Uh, I love the bra- the uh, the bell rays kazoo. Yes, thank you, thank you very. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> that doesn't say bell rays. It doesn't say the bell rays on it. It just oh. says rock show. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. Uh, do, what are your guys' pl- like? Do you guys have a plan moving forward now that things are maybe lightening up? We do. We um, uh, we had an, a U.S. tour that we were supposed to start actually in April that unfortunately got uh, canceled due to uh, personal family reasons by the co-headliner that we were with that we were supposed that we had rescheduled this thing for like three. This was our third time uh. rescheduling. So. Um, that's not going to happen, but because that's not going to happen, we've decided to go into the studio and actually get a recording done. So awesome! we're just doing everything that we can do to just step right in. I mean, that's one thing for sure that people in rock bands are already pretty malleable, you know, especially on these, uh, lower tiers like we are, but keeping yourself supple and making sure that you can keep just just move with the punches. Just kind of go with it. As long as it feels good to do that is, you know, a superpower. And we're leaning into that. When Bob, you guys you go in to make a record now, um, is it just the two of you and a drummer and Bob takes care of tracking bass and guitar? Do you guys have a solid lineup right now? Um, We're... <laughs> If the bell rings, that's always a trick question, but uh, we right. will have a drummer and a bass player, and um, we're just gonna we're gonna see how that all works out because uh, they're gonna be brand new people. They're gonna be people we haven't ever used before, so we're just trying new stuff because so many people's lives. I don't know if you've run into this too, but so many people's lives have changed since. What well, things are different? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what well, things are different? I ha- I hadn't noticed. 
but so many musicians that I talk to um, are now those guys that say, like there used to be the guys that would say, um, how long is a tour? Seven weeks. Oh, only seven weeks. And then you go and you say, how long, you say, how long is a tour? And they say seven weeks, seven weeks. You know, <laughs> it's a different, right. it's a different thing after a pandemic, how long people are willing to actually stay on the road. How many people still want to be musicians that go out on the road? People have had time to evaluate. There's a reason that record industries used to make bands stay out there for years because you have a little time off. You start acting like a regular human. You start behaving like, I like my pillow. I love my bed. Yeah. Sleep is great. Like, <laughs> it's great. It's really, yeah, not sleeping in a moving vehicle is pretty sweet living. I don't have to go to an airport and just lose five hours of my life getting there, standing in line, doing all this other stuff, and then the time on the plane. Like, I don't have to do any of that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, there's so many people that have made that decision to, uh, you know, limit, put limits on how often they want to go out. And I'm down with that. I, I kind of feel like us learning how to do this stuff online also showed me, I feel really good doing shows the way that I was doing them. I thought that I would lose some emotional bandwidth, you know, like, oh, I don't feel like I'm connecting. I actually got more. I actually started to feel like, oh my God, these people are really, they really feel good about this. They're really a part of this. Right. I'm looking forward to waking up and seeing them show up there, like their faces, their, you know, that, or their comments, whatever it is that allows me to know who they are. It's, it's a different place out there. So yeah, with shifting and getting new people and, or or other people needing to go on tours with other bands. It's just one of those things where we've done it before and we're going to do it again because it's just the way that we do things. But there's a lot less judging of what that means or looking at it as, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, just kind of looking at it like it's a thing that has to be done. We, uh, we've sort of, we've talked a lot about the parts of touring that are difficult and frustrating and exhausting and just really draining. And for, for any non-musicians that are listening, it must seem absolutely <laughs> fucking ludicrous that someone would put themselves through this, but the 45 to 90 minutes a night that you have to do what you are there to do almost always outweighs all of the other stuff. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. I would say that it is, it's the thing that helps keep you crazy. It's the thing that helps keep you crazy enough to just keep doing it because it feels so good to do that. Now, I know many musicians, too, that have been on the road for many years that self-medicate because whatever that thing is, it they're not tapping into it in the same way that I'm fortunate enough to be able to tap into and just realize, oh, my God, even when it's not f fun, it's everything that I need to do. It's everything that... that in the way that I express myself or I do this thing that I do and I get to do it in another city and I get to, you know, or do it in another country. I mean, those, that's when it's like, this is a gift. This is a real, that's when you look at it just that way where it's just like, this is, this is unlike anything, any other profession out there, you know, because even as a stand up comedian, you still have to speak the same language as the people that you go to play for with music, you don't have to do that. Right. I, I can go anywhere and communicate with people. And once you go back to cities that you visited before you recognize faces, sometimes you make friends like real friends. Absolutely. And uh, that makes that part of touring also interesting on another level. 
you get to experience Absolutely. experience towns, cities, and you know through experience with a local. Uh, I love it. No, I I do too. And just to kind of circle back a little bit, because you you did mention you said we talked about all the the these things that are negative or not negative, but just the the hard the things. Or even when we were talking about the let's talk about some awesome stuff. I want to be real clear that no matter what it is that we have on this journey, it's not supposed to be easy. Nothing right. in life. Who said that in the owner's manual for life that anything that you do is supposed to be easy? We're just supposed to find out how to frame it ourselves. We just need to, for us, our level of success is not measured over how many records we sell or how many or whether those dots connected and whether enough people found out about us. If I find a true fan tomorrow, one of them, it's been worth it. You know what I mean? It's not about... It's not about really comparing it to everything else that's out there. It's about being able to sustain the thing that you love to do, the thing that you're driven to do, and to find joy in that. And doing those shows during the pandemic, I was able to really lean into every gratitude that I could think of. And I and I have them every day. I have them more now than I ever had before because you just frame it differently. You just look at it with a different perspective. Not even that different. Just squint your eyes a little bit and just right. say, is that really that bad? <laughs> at, at the top of our conversation, you had you talked about some meditation and some yoga. Is that something yeah. that you have had in your life for a long time? Or is that something that came along in the last couple of years? A lot of people like there's been a lot of things to motivate many of us in that direction in the last couple of years. I'm fortunate enough to have had that element um, in my life since about 2000 or somewhere around there. When we first started touring, I that was when I was first introduced to yoga and started looking, you know, at it. I've never been a steady practitioner like those people that, you know, with the yoga body, they just get out there and they do the whole sequence and everything over and over. I've never been like that, but I've always been in the mindset and the readings. Um, and occasionally when I can get into it, I get into the physical part. And meditation has been something that I've been involved in since about the 2010s off and on, but never, you know, never with absolute regularity, but I under, I get it. I get what it gives me. I understand that part. And I think it's also one of the reasons that we were not able to maneuver into the space, into this, you know, keeping yourself flexible and supple is not just a physical thing. It's a mental thing. And that kind of thinking and looking at the world that way um, helped. Now, there is also the thing that I got to mention, sometimes your mind can be too open that your brain falls out. <laughs> so you don't want that. <laughs> you don't want just, that. I, <laughs> I just told someone earlier today how living in the information age is the most dangerous time to be alive. It because is. every like if you hear something, it's it already got in. It already got in. That's right. And That's you have to right. be careful what you think. You have to be careful what you think. And you also have to remember that just because you have an opinion doesn't mean you should say anything about it or you even <laughs> have enough information to even debate it or question it or right. do any of that. It would be like me going up to a banker and saying, you know, I don't really agree with this this statement that you have here of all my accounts for all these years. Right. I, I I just don't agree with that. So I want you to change that because... I don't understand your rubric, and I'm telling you that since I don't understand that somehow something is wrong, everyone would say I was that was absurd. If you did the same thing about plumbing, if I somebody came up and tried to tell me what to do about music, yeah. I got some shit to say to the people that uh, control my credit card balances. <laughs> but I get it, I get it. But it's one of those things where where everything's not up for debate. You know, it's just not, it's not one of those things that I look, I just look at it like that, but there are feelings that you can have. And, you know, I just feel like I'm more buoyant. The more I think about 
the 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 gratefulness and the gratitude involved in us being able to have this dream and live this dream for all these years. It's wonderful. And nobody cares about anyone else's stupid feelings anyway. <laughs> right? Really? When it comes down to it, they don't care about, nobody cares about my stupid feelings. It's one of those things where I always, as a kid though, I remember feeling like, did somebody say that just to break me down? Just to make me feel like I'm not wor like, oh, I remember hearing people say, don't get your hopes up. That <laughs> There's nothing more defeating than somebody telling you, don't get your hopes up. You know, right. why not just let whatever is going to happen, happen? Why just not just let tell it happen. me to quit? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or, exactly. Or just turn exactly. around and walk away and don't say right. shit. How about say nothing? Don't say anything. That's the, the some of the best shit I've ever heard was in my, you know, things we grew up with. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like, we could learn from that. We could really learn from that. Sometimes I'm hearing not saying nothing it works from for a peer, every little thing. <laughs> sometimes hearing nothing from Says a, a peer that you want to hear something from is worse than them saying, "Don't get your hopes up." <laughs> it's, sometimes, but the thing is, is it wasn't said, and right. then you have that to maneuver around. Then you have that to react to in another way. But you know, it's we're in a we're in a very fortunate time, and I remember really glomming onto that when we were doing our, our, when we do our online rock shows, I'm just like, we're so fortunate that we're at this age where we can all be communicating right now. This is a very, this is a, a, even though it's odd, it can be odd for us all together. And there's something to that. There's something to being in a weird way with a bunch of other people feeling the same thing. When when do you guys go in the studio, and when can we expect a new record to be out? We're going in the studio the day after Easter, and we're super excited. I was I was actually just on the phone yesterday, figuring all this out. I I don't want to say it's going to be out this year, but definitely by twenty twenty three, it will be out. It could be out before that, but. Um, we just got to make sure we do it right. And, um, should we expect some more full circle, uh, unbridled sort of more, uh, roots, uh, high energy roots rock or what do, where do you see stuff heading with the new material? I think that's a, what you just mentioned is, you know, that's definitely something that will happen. But there's going to be other little bits in there, too. And this is me speaking from um, fresh off the demo listening. <laughs> yeah. Like we were literally just listening to them last night and figuring, like saying yay or nay to certain ideas. And some of those ideas are still being formulated. So it's premature for me to actually really map it out. But um, I think it's going to be delicious. I'm certain that it will. I'm I'm real excited for <laughs> more uh, more new music from you guys. Also, I thank you again to both of you uh, for delivering top sh your your top shelf uh, for couch riffs videos. Our couch riffing that is what a great idea that is. Thank you. That you is guys. how long have you been doing that? It's amazing. Two years, well, two years. I've been doing, you know. So you I was, started it in the pandemic. I started doing it before, but it was called Couchress because I would have people would come to my apartment in Brooklyn and we would sit on the couch and play along to a back backing track. Ah, so it didn't nice. start out as these quarantine videos. It started out more as a um, first take. We would rehearse, and then it would be like, all right, I'm going to push record, and whatever happens, yes. happens. So if you fuck up, don't stop. Keep going. This right. is a performance. Yes. This, isn't, this ain't yes. a recording studio. We're not trying to make yes. a record. Right? The danger and beauty of music is all about that. I love that. 
it's amazing how many people will cry about it. Right now, <laughs> I always say, you're a musician, right? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I'm sorry. That's are you my, a musician? That's... <laughs> are you a rock star or a musician that's yeah. What... <laughs> yeah. Ba- yeah no that's a that's a well unfortunately you know <laughs> some some folks oh my um, god but yeah thank you so much uh, someday uh the idea is that i want to tour this 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 i'm put i'm you're right on the spot right now I'm putting you. I'm gonna put you both on the spot. <laughs> so the idea is that I want to tour this, right? So let's uh-huh. just say, for instance, I get, I come out to LA. I book. I'm there for a long weekend. I book four podcasts. They're on a hmm. on a stage and like a small, like you know, they're all those. There's so many weird little venues, like little yeah. movie houses, ind- independent movie houses or whatever. Do a do a podcast with an audience talk nice like, like uh, if it was you and me we'd be sitting on the stage like uh uh normals and uh yeah yeah and then afterwards there's a a band a miss you know mix and match and we do five or six I songs like that. Right? i love that so it's basically like a combination of what i was doing and in the beginning and and what I've been doing through the pandemic and and then a step further so it just kind of ties everything together but I would absolutely you know in LA I would love to have you guys involved if if I can make it all happen it would be great we'd consider it an honor to be involved in it it sounds something like oh, James on. Lipton's uh inside the artist studio kind of thing but with musicians in more. With, yeah, with a bunch of <laughs> dirtbag rockers. Yes, yes, <laughs> indeed. I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, I, I would, I would love it. I would absolutely love it if you guys. It sounds would awesome. That. Um, well, I'm excited for new recording. I'm sorry to hear about the tour. Really sorry. Yeah, about me that. too. Me too. And it was going to be one of those things. That's why the whole thing with the new band was so. Uh, because we had already planned on these, these new guys coming in and we were like, oh, and then we'll just get together right before and learn this, which is crazy, but we were going to do that anyway. And now um, it's like, well, let's just get together before we go and do our touring in Europe, you know, in later in the year and get to know each other and get to know some songs before that. So you guys will be going to Europe later this year. We are in Ju- in June. We are going to go. So in June, June, July. Where uh, where are you guys going to be? Are, are there are your dates posted yet? Not all of them. There are dates that kept getting moved because they were stuff that we had booked in 2020. So we're right. trying to honor that. Everything that we we have nothing that is newly booked <laughs> that we that we booked because we've just been trying to get everything that had been booked in 2020. Right. Completely uh, done. But um, yeah, we're, we're just, we are doing Europe dates and hopefully I'm hoping that we'll be able to throw something, even if it's just the West coast in at the end of the year. But I don't know. It looks like, it looks like whatever we do in 2022 that we already have on the books is going to be what's done for 2022. And then we'll go into 2023 to, to do anything else. It's just, it just seems like one of those years where everybody's going to be rebooking still from stuff that they didn't get done for 2021 and 2020. Well, I'm going to keep my eyes peeled uh, at your Europe dates. I'll be over there in in June also. So hopefully, oh, you will also we'll be we'll be near we'll be nearby, and uh, I'll get so, to see you guys. Awesome, 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 awesome. Do you know about when? What part of the month you guys are going over there? We're like May 15 to June 12 and then a couple weeks off and then back over to Europe. And and there are there's some like Eastern Europe stuff booked and I don't know if that's going to be happening right. or not. We'll You, you have know, to see yeah, we'll absolutely. See, if, see what happens. But fingers crossed. I I really hope to uh get to see you guys. Me too. 
Me too. That'll be fun. I really hope so. Listen, thank you so much for you gave me almost two hours. That's incredible. <laughs> I hope some of it's usable. <laughs> it's a, no, it's a, this is gold. This is what we do. We just get on and talk. And I ask people about their musical history and just sort of, you know, I think get get behind, get inside of people's heads and what keeps them motivated. I think it's. Inc- I didn't. I didn't know you guys uh, had a kid and raised a kid all through. That seems all this uh, just is uh, incredible. Yeah. And she's awesome. I mean, we're really lucky. You know, is she into music? We scored big. Or is she's she not, resent music? You know, <laughs> she is, she's got a beautiful voice and she does not want to use it at all in that yeah. way. And that's fine. That's her prerogative. But whatever your parents do, it's like you're always going to do the opposite of whatever it is. And that's great. Right. And she got to see a lot of struggling. So if I were her, I'd hide that thing too. After <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I'm going to kill this thing. Okay. 